Hello, good afternoon. Um, Claire and I are joined again by uh, Jonathan Calbraith and Chris Goodwin from Matheson Consulting, uh, a well-known and well-respected pension expert company helping people um, decipher all of the issues to do with pensions on divorce and a very good job of it they do as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. This is the final um, video blog in a series of three that you've helped us with so thank you very much for your time. Um, so uh, we've saved some of the best questions till last so perhaps Jonathan if I could start with you. Um, what are the more complex pensions that you have had to deal with in, in situations? Uh, yes, we, we do see some, some rather complex schemes. So I'm um, certainly with regards to the, the public sector defined benefit schemes, uh, the ones for, for the uniformed services, uh, police, fire brigade and armed forces are slightly more complex than most. I, I certainly mentioned in the previous uh, blog that um, one of the issues that comes up there is that the the members are usually able to retire at comparatively young ages, whereas the ex spouses are not, and that has to be addressed. Um, then within the defined benefit uh, private sector sphere, that there are a myriad of schemes that are all different, and uh, we whichever scheme comes up, we usually have to gather quite a bit of information about what has been accrued over the years. I, I don't necessarily want to name name names of, of companies that have got truly horrendous pension schemes. <laughs> uh, some of the banks that will remain unnamed have um, some rather complex schemes. I think companies that have seen a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions work over the years where schemes have been amalgamated into each other uh, can often be more complex, uh, where some decisions have been made in the past that haven't really added a lot for the members, but have certainly made the benefits more difficult to, to calculate, for example. Um, right. On the defined contribution side, it tends to be that most defined contribution arrangements that people have been in since about 2000 are vanilla, as it were. They're, they're very, very straightforward. It's some of these older arrangements that still have a few bells and whistles that uh, that, that add to the complexity. For in, in, in particular, guaranteed annuity rates. I uh, might remember the, uh, <clears throat> the collapse a number of years ago of equitable life. That was in, in a nutshell what did for them was guaranteed annuity rates where there's an underlying benefit promise that you can con convert your fund into a per annum pension income on terms that they set. Whenever these exist, uh, there is real as hen's teeth these days, but policies that still have them are incredibly valuable indeed. And then we, we often see some other things uh, that of arrangements that, that are notionally defined contribution but have a few underlying benefit promises such as um, uh, promises of, of investment returns uh, with profits policies, um, things that have been bought out from legacy pension schemes and there's a promise to pay a uh, GMP guaranteed minimum pension. So certainly if you are seeing defined contribution arrangements that are more than about 20 years old then sometimes there are, there are some other oddities that need to be investigated along the way. But uh, there are a few complex ones out there, shall we say. Keeps, keeps you very interested, I imagine, Jonathan. Absolutely. <laughs> so question for you, Chris, how do you allow for state pensions in your analysis? Yeah, state pensions, I mean, they have changed considerably over the years with the latest set of changes coming in in 2016. To some extent, those changes are simplified state pensions. So many cases now that we look at, we consider the parties accrued state pension and then their forecast state pension. And quite often, if you look at forecast state pensions, in sort of today's money terms, both parties quite often are going to have a similar figure because that's how the, sc the scheme has now been developed uh, for parties. So you'll see uh, one, the state pensions now are accrued over like a 35 year period. And it's not only national insurance contributions that count, but actually national insurance credits. So whereas in the past we saw some very significant disparities in state pensions, less so now. So quite often in our reports, we're saying, well, actually, if you look at forecast state pensions, they're probably going to be pretty similar when each party reaches state pension age. Thank you, Chris. It's always interesting to hear of the changes and how, thing, how things are being affected. And I suppose in a similar vein, Jonathan, we're sometimes told by pension experts that people's um, state of health or any medical conditions might affect the calculations you do. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? 
Certainly, it, it's something, uh, Rachel, that comes up from, from time to time in letters of instructions. Sometimes we're told that one party or the other has certain medical medical conditions. Sometimes it's just mentioned in passing, and sometimes we're explicitly asked to take account of this in the calculations that we perform. Um, the, the first thing I would say, and this is the thing that people almost always forget, is that if your life expectancy is reduced on grounds of ill health, then you need less money to provide a per annum pension income for the rest of your life. So solicitors that keep arguing about how ill uh, the client is on their side are effectively arguing uh, the, that individual out of money. And usually when this is pointed out to solicitors, they tend never to mention it ever again. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just one of these things, it's, it's a little bit paradoxical that if someone is ill, should we really give that person less money because he or she might not be expected to live quite so long? That, intuitively feels a little bit wrong. I think the other thing we'd say is that, you know, leaving aside any sort of moral arguments like that, it is somewhat difficult to allow for uh, health conditions on the grounds that quite often we're told so-and-so has such and such conditions and is age 50 today, please assume that he or she retires at age 60. So even if we know what the conditions are today and what the prognosis is today and how it's being treated today, we don't know what state of health that person will be in in 10 years time. To put it bluntly, things might have got better, things might have got worse, or the person may have died in the interim period. It's impossible really to make any allowance for future health conditions uh, rather than current ones. If we are looking at current ones, um, if we're provided with information such as a doctor's letter um, uh, that suggests so-and-so might have X years of life expectancy or X fewer years of life expectancy than, than, a, than a typical person, we can allow for that if we are instructed. But uh, the thing you've got to remember is that Chris and, Chris and me, we're not doctors, we certainly don't want either of us to perform an operation on you, and uh, <laughs> we cannot really interpret information, um, for example, health conditions and medication that people take. Uh, there are annuity calculators where you can allow for these things, but we are not in a position to take that information and provide an expert opinion upon it. We are very much reliant on, on a real health expert being quite frank and being quite uh, prescriptive, as it were, about future life expectancy. So it really is only under those circumstances that we could seek to allow for it. So Chris, can you tell me what the lifetime allowance is and how that impacts the calculations that you do? Oh yes, the lifetime allowance. The lifetime allowance has actually been around for quite some time now. It was first introduced in 2006, but I expect most people weren't aware of it because it was very much aimed at pensions payable to your very high earners. Typically, say a pension of £90,000 a year or more, only if the pension was above that would you trigger the lifetime allowance tax charge. So I think for quite a number of years, very few people were affected by this. However, things have changed. The government started to reduce that lifetime allowance to bring more people into the tax net to pay it. And lo and behold, it's it fell. It's now been frozen at a level of uh, just over a million, one million, seven 73,100 or something like that and it's now it's been frozen until April 2026. Yeah. So far more people are being affected by the lifetime allowance. So what this means then when we come to look at pension sharing we may have to allow for one party or even both parties paying some lifetime allowance tax charge. It's complicated because the lifetime allowance the actual how the allowance is calculated differs between a defined benefits scheme and a defined contribution scheme. So you can get in this very bizarre situation where one party with a defined benefit probably wouldn't incur any lifetime allowance, but the other party given a fair pension share might actually incur a lifetime allowance tax charge. These are things that we can model, but when we model it, we always have to bring in this very strong caveat. This is a lifetime allowance. It was introduced in 2000 six at 1.8 million at the time we were told oh it's going to be CPI linked and we all sort of bought into that and said okay we can understand where this is coming from but since then because of the huge reductions it's now been frozen you know ask Rishi Sunak what the lifetime allowance might be in future years. We can only really use the information provided. So at the moment we're assuming it actually stays level. So over time, it might bring in more and more people. We all know about inflation at the moment, but you know, if people's 
pension benefits are uh, going up in line with some measure of inflation, but the lifetime allowance remains fixed, more and more will get caught by this lifetime allowance. So the figure of 1.8 million once you think, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's only those finance directors that are going to get caught by this. Well, no longer. It is surprising the types of people, the types of occupation they're in get caught now by the lifetime allowance. It's no longer for your finance directors. Yeah. And the other thing I, I would say, that I completely agree with everything you said, Chris, it, it's so important if, you're, if your clients are in that position that they seek the advice of an IFA or some kind of financial planner, even more so than would otherwise be the case upon divorce. As uh, without getting into all the detail, there are decisions to be made on things like uh, the age at which the parties retire, how they take the benefits, uh, whether you share the pension first and then the person retires or vice versa in, in some cases. That there are so many subtleties to this and the exact ordering of events and what happens can influence whether any LTA tax charges payable or otherwise. And again, we can perform the calculations, but we cannot give advice on these points. Thank you very much. That's a, a really helpful um, explanation of the lifetime allowance and the issues to, to be aware of. Um, Jonathan, coming to you, uh, we would be remiss in doing any sort of video blogs uh, about pensions without um, mentioning uh, the Galbraith tables named after your good self. You shall ever be forever be famous. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and I saw a recent article actually in the Financial Remedies Journal, one of the things that we have access to that help us stay up to date with everything. There was a lot of jargon in it. I, th I think I got the gist of it. Um, and in terms of offsetting, and we often hear a pound of pension isn't worth the same as a pound of cash. But could you tell us a little bit more about these tables, which I'm sure took rather a long time to put together? But if you could uh, explain a bit more for everybody to understand, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it, it's not just a vanity exercise on, on my part, uh, <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, these uh, tables were something that, that Chris and I pulled together uh, last year and early this year, in, intended to be a resource that would be useful in particular for practitioners who are trying to place a, a ballpark valuation upon uh, defined benefit pension incomes that are payable in retirement, recognising that these are potentially payable uh, at, from, from different ages and that the parties are different ages uh, just now, and that there isn't any helpful rule of thumb there. Uh, they're not intended to replace uh, the Duxbury tables, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but they're more geared towards the capitalisation of spousal maintenance rather than necessarily being used to value pension incomes themselves. So what, what sits behind that are some fairly broad brush assumptions that we made, uh, which are set out in the, the document that accompanies the tables. Um, it didn't actually take that long to prepare the tables themselves. The, the, the explanation <laughs> that goes with it and the justification that goes with it was the thing that we call the time. Um, but the idea is there. Um, some, some typical assumptions are made as to how an individual might invest money in the period to retirement and what might be done with it after retirement to come out with a reasonable value for uh, a pension. And in, in particular, we find that somebody who is turning age 60 now and wishes to secure a, a pound per annum of income for the rest of his or her life, you might be looking at a figure of between 33 and 36 pounds of capital that would be required to provide that. And that, that is, if you like, the starting point, and we then can build in other things such as lump sums that might accompany the pension. And as I said, take account of the different ages at which people might want to retire. But that was really the thinking behind it. Um, why would practitioners find this useful? I, I think in particular, when questions about offsetting come up, it's always one of these things that we're asked to perform offsetting calculations um, where we have no knowledge of what the other assets are, and nor should we. But it's just, I, I often wonder, is it particularly useful to perform offsetting calculations when the pensions might be worth well over a million pounds and the total capital available for offsetting is perhaps 200,000 pounds? What use is it knowing how to do the offsetting when such capital doesn't exist? And if that helps practitioners get a bit of a handle on some of these things as a starting point, at letter of instruction stage, then that probably makes uh, the solicitor's job easier, certainly makes our job easier, and it pr probably saves the clients a little bit of money as well. So that leads really neatly on to our next question, which is if someone wants to keep the pension, the other person wants to keep the house, how do they use those tables? And is it better they instruct you to look at it or, or how move forward? 
I mean, that, that's quite a typical scenario, isn't it? You know, one party keeps the formal marital home, the other party keeps the pension. Um, what those tables can do, uh, they're a very good starting point and they, the, a practitioner can see, place a value on those pensions. So let's say you know, the, the pensions of Mr, the pensions of Mrs, and have values which then can be compared with the value of the formal marital home. Now, that could just be the end point or it could then be something, just one step. The next step is then pass it on to someone like ourselves who could refine those calculations, who could consider both offsetting and pension sharing. So we, we often refer to that as partial uh, offsetting, whereby some of the party's non-pension capital is used together with, say, maybe a reduced pension sharing order. So we think the Galbraith table is a very good starting point for the place of value on those pensions. So you can start off saying, that, OK, this is what these pensions might be worth. This is what the formal marital home might be worth. Are they broadly equivalent? If they're not, could we then bring in pension sharing into the mix as well to come up with an overall solution? But what we, I think, building on what Jonathan has says there, we gain a sense as, at times that there's no real understanding of what the pensions are worth until people have actually got our report. And it almost feels like a bit too late in the day, as it were. And I mean, there's a, certainly at times we feel that when people come to our section on offsetting, they look at some of the numbers there and then quickly shut the report. Oh, I don't think we're going to consider this. And really, have us do all these figures on offsetting if the report's going to be closed in about 10 seconds because those figures are so large. It doesn't really help anyone. So if people can get an understanding what pensions are can really be worth, and I think sometimes are surprised how much those pensions are worth. You know, they can actually be quite somewhat larger than the worth of the formal marital home. That often surprises the parties. Then all the better if they you get if you can use those figures as a starting point, and if needs be, we can refine them. Yeah. Thank you. And so this sort of ties things up in the sense of. Um, I'm sure people listening to the three video blogs that you very kindly dedicated your time to help us put together to answer some of the mysteries of pensions. It all starts with a letter of instruction, though. And um, have you got any templates that you particularly recommend? Um, are there different types of letters for different types of report? If you could maybe, because um, I'm sure you're going to get lots of instructions now that you've done a series of video blogs and people can, it's always very nice, I think, for people to see the faces behind the names on these reports. But um, where do people start and what sort of letters of instruction do you like to receive? Gotcha. Yes, we, we, we are real people. Uh, we are actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think um, what I would say there is I would direct um, solicitors and others to uh, the PAG report as published by the, the Pensions Advisory Group back in 2019, which does have, I think there is a, a template letter of instruction in there and it does give a lot of advice as to the kind of things that should be covered. What I would say is we don't want to get into a position where we are checking our own homework, so we cannot really come up with the questions that you want to ask us. No. Somebody else needs to do that. Um, what, what I would say is be cover off everything that you think needs to be covered off, but don't don't fill up the blunderbuss and put absolutely everything in it. Going back to Chris's point there about offsetting. If offsetting really isn't practical because there aren't any assets, then don't ask for it. <clears throat> if it's a long marriage and needs are not met and uh, solicitors know that arguments for uh, the apportionment or ring fencing of benefits will be thrown out by the court, then there is no point in commissioning a lot of work to provide other sets of calculations that take account of these things. <clears throat> um, that's what I would suggest really. Um, beyond that, uh, we do have a, a template letter of instruction though for cases where we're only being asked to look at offsetting. So if okay. it has been agreed that there's going to be no pension sharing for whatever reason, and a simple valuation of the pensions for offsetting purposes is required, then if you go onto our website, you'll be able to find details of uh, the offsetting only report that we can do, where we will provide you with a template letter of instruction. And it is one of these things where there's a big long list of all the things that we're not going to cover. So these wouldn't cover pension sharing, they wouldn't then cover partial offsetting, we're not going to look at state pensions, we're certainly not going to get into anything involving foreign pensions or a whole heap of other things. But if it's a fairly straightforward case, and you're perfectly happy that all you want is some offsetting numbers, uh, there is a template one there and we'd be able to turn that round for uh, a reduced fee compared to what we would typically charge. 
That's really helpful to know. Thank you, Jonathan. And Claire and I will make sure your email addresses are on our website and the YouTube video. But do you want to just tell people who are listening to these video blogs what your website address is in case they wanted to have a look at the template letter that you're referring to? Certainly, it's the usual three W's dot M C A C T. So MacAct dot co dot UK. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Jonathan from Matheson Consulting. Thank you so much for your time, both in relation to this, the last in our series of three pension bogs. I mean, Claire and I have certainly both found it very informative and you've given some great information and some top tips. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Oh, a pleasure. Thank you.